He konai purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. In the town I grew up in, there was a man who knew how to do things. His name was Colin Murdoch. He was a chemist, among other things, and he was the kind of guy people would ask to solve problems for them. He always said yes, and he always got the job done. Colin was an ideas man and an inventor, and in 1952 he had a very big idea indeed. He um, had the idea on the way back from Auckland. He'd been up for his brother's wedding. This is Marilyn Murdoch, Colin's wife. And he went to write something down on the flight home and took his pen out of his pocket. And when I screwed the cap off the pen... And this is Colin himself. I suddenly got the bright idea that a syringe that was disposable but which utilised a cap to protect the needle, to keep the needle and the contents of the syringe sterile. And then he drew the disposable hypodermic. Think about that for a moment and think about how many times you've come in contact with this brainwave. Colin Albert Murdoch, to give him his full name, dreamed up the sterile, pre-filled, disposable syringe on a plane and then developed it in his home workshop in Timaru, South Canterbury. He was 23 years old. Around 16 billion syringes are used every year around the world, and if you know of a Kiwi invention that more people have used or that has saved more lives, I'd be keen to hear about it. In Timaru, though, he was always known as the tranquilizer gun guy. They always think of me as the one who invented the tranquilizer gun. <laughs> of all of the things I invented, I think the most important are the disposable syringe for human use and the disposable automatic vaccinator and its vaccine bag for animal vaccination, both of which are used in, in, in huge numbers all over the world. These clips of Colin are from a short film about him, commissioned by Philip Howe, who runs the South Canterbury Museum. Colin's famous fountain pen is stored there, and this is Philip Howe. Well, it's a um, quite a nice, ornate fountain pen of the sort that was um, used in the 1940s and 50s, sort of early, mid-20th century. And this particular pen was given to Colin uh, while he was at secondary school. In fact, I think it was given to him by his parents when he started secondary school around 1942 or 43. Colin Murdoch was born in Christchurch in 1929 into a family of chemists. He must have been an interesting kid. He was dyslexic, ambidextrous, he experimented with chemicals, made his own gunpowder for the rifle that he'd built himself, and he registered his first patent at the age of 11. He wanted to be a surgeon, but he was steered towards pharmacy, and he opened his first practice in Timaru at the age of 25. Three years later, a mutual female friend set Colin up on a blind date with Marilyn. He turned up to the local cinema with his leg in a plaster. He'd broken it skiing. And at the end of the performance, she just said, to Colin, oh, you can take her home. And I'm not really quite sure. I mean, he had a big plaster on. I'm not quite sure how I got home, but <laughs> I did. They married six months later, and Marilyn discovered Colin's inventive bent when he moved a metal lathe into their top floor flat. And the two elderly ladies downstairs wondered what on earth the noise was, but they didn't ever really get any satisfaction. <laughs> Colin had been working on the syringe before he met Marilyn. Syringes then were made of glass or steel and they were used multiple times. As a chemist and a man keen on medicine, Colin knew the risks of cross-contamination that they posed, even when they were properly sterilised. What was needed was a single-use product made from inexpensive materials that could be disposed of after use. Plastic was the answer. Colin took his prototype to the New Zealand Health Department, who dismissed it as too futuristic. So he took out patents in Australasia and put the syringe out to market where, after a bit of a slow start, it's fair to say it did pretty well as a concept. Colin got on with making the syringes better, and in time, the lives of basically every newborn child, every hospital or GP patient, every diabetic, every person with HIV or AIDS, and every intravenous drug user were improved and on many, many occasions saved because of Colin Murdoch's brainwave. And in 1959, he had another good idea. Tranquilizer guns, with a hypodermic syringe instead of a bullet. You know those Animal Planet documentaries where scientists drug a lion or a tiger so they can measure it or medically treat it? Those scientists owe their literal skins to Colin Murdoch. Here's his second son, David. He was determined, and if he came across a problem, he, he would solve it one way or the other. He used to go to bed and he could... Uh 
dream these images and he could rotate them, you know, three dimensional in his head and and do the design as if he were using CAD and it was all internalised and uh, predominantly used to happen at night. He used to always have a pen, uh, a pen and paper beside the bed and uh, he would uh, wake up having solved problems and uh, make a few notes, take a, a few drawings and uh, it would be there waiting for him in the morning. Colin's father once said his mind was like a corkscrew, drilling down into a problem to expose the solution. Marilyn Murdoch agrees and says Colin lived by two maxims. Observation is the key to innovation. Never stop imagining what might be hidden in the obvious. And I think that's the way he saw the world. Colin founded a company called Pax Arms to make the tranquilizer guns and travelled the world promoting them. He said yes to most offers that came his way. Yes to a busy pharmacy, yes to life as an inventor, an entrepreneur, yes to problem solving for big international companies and local folk, even yes to freelance work as a TV cameraman. Without a doubt, he's what we'd nowadays call an active relaxer. He was a very busy man. He used to get out of bed after I'd left to go to school. And uh, he'd arrive home in, in the twilight hours and... Uh, uh, Mum used to take his, his meal out to the workshop. He would often not even have time to sit at the table and eat with us. He would be straight out. We had a workshop at home and he'd be out there and you'd hear machine noises uh, right through the night. You know, you'd wake up and think, what was that? And it was, it was Dad turning a piece of metal, doing something out there. Uh, so, yeah, we, 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 <laughs> we didn't see a lot of him. He was busy um, when he was at home and uh, often he wasn't at home. It was not something that my mum always appreciated. Yes, well, I certainly didn't anticipate having a, an absentee husband because he was away a great deal. Colin went everywhere with the tranquilizer gun. He went to Europe, Africa, the Northern Territory. It, it was difficult. I, I didn't know from one day to the next, really. He could come home in the lunch hour and say, I'm going to Australia this afternoon. <laughs> I got to the stage, actually, I used to say that if he didn't spend some time at home, the children wouldn't know him. And did he listen? Did he start spending a bit more time at home? Not really. No, he was driven. David says he, his sister Janine and his brothers Andrew and Robert, they missed their dad, but they didn't suffer too badly. You know, we were reasonably well-adjusted kids, my, my, myself and my siblings. I don't think that we were disadvantaged by his absence, but it's certainly something that we, we noticed. You know, I, I had a good relationship with my dad, but I think I probably could have had a better relationship if I had had more of his time. And I think my, my, my siblings would, would share that thought. David calls his mum Marilyn the hero of the story, and that's hard to argue with. Of course, there were bonuses for kids whose dad did unusual things. <laughs> I remember one particular design, they were Vaxi guns. No, oh, great water squirters. And uh, <laughs> we found these things, and uh, as, as kids do, I, I took mine to school, and uh, a great delight in squirting everyone. Dad was uh, quite upset because uh, they were prototypes and they were top secret. And there were all these bits of guns in his workshop. That's too much temptation for any kid. It was certainly too much for David. Well, I got in there and uh, I put a few of those gun pieces together uh, to something uh, uh, resembling a pistol. And uh, I took it to school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Big sister Janine used to quite naturally tell the other kids at school what her dad was up to. And she was telling all these tales of, of trips around Africa and tigers and tranquilizing rhinos and things like that. And her teacher thought that she was telling a lot of tall tales. In 2000, Colin was made an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit for inventing, and Janine's teacher had to think again. He wrote to Colin and he said he realises that Janine was not telling stories, that she was actually telling the truth. It just seemed so far-fetched. Tigers, rhinos and sharks. Oh, my. We got a phone call. There was a rogue shark in the, in the Timaru Harbour. So Dad was called to take care of it, and he went down and took care of it with a with a pistol. <laughs> Something would be uh, stuck in a pipe. Uh, he would take care of it with a small explosive charge. <laughs> he couldn't say no. People 
wanted him to do things and somehow he always managed to fit them in. You'd imagine that a man like Colin Murdoch would have made a lot of money. And the answer is no, not really. He could only afford patents for the syringe in Australasia at first and bigger players took advantage. There wasn't a lot he could do about that. He told a journalist that patents give you the right to sue but not the money to do it. The family was comfortably well off, says Marilyn, and she's not sure what Colin would have considered being successful anyway. That's difficult to say. I think he was pleased to see his inventions being used, and I think there was a certain satisfaction knowing that he'd invented them. Money hadn't really been the primary mover, I don't think. What about you? What did you want? I just would have appreciated it, really, if if Colin had been home more. Over a four-decade career, Colin Murdoch developed 46 patents, including a silent burglar alarm and a childproof bottle cap, and won multiple gold medals at the World Inventors' Fair. When the family sold up in the late 80s, Colin retired, and he could justifiably put his feet up. Needless to say, that's not what he did. Marilyn says, if anything, he was busier, and it was around this time that Philip Howe met Colin for the first time. He rang me up and said, look, we're, we're cleaning out the shop. There's a few things here you might be of interest for the museum. So I went around to meet him. And we got on very well. He's a very personable guy. I remember once attending a discussion group that Colin ran um, in private homes uh, of an evening. And uh, he invited me to come and talk about the museum to um, the, uh, the people in this group. And I realised that Colin valued knowledge. He valued the exchange of knowledge um, and was, I believe, a really genuine, warm-hearted sort of person. But in 1991, far too soon, Colin's health took a turn. For a year, he was treated for sinus problems. But one morning he came out and said, I've got a tumour because he said, I'm going to lose my eye and my cheekbone and, and probably the roof of my mouth. And friends thought that was an exaggeration, but it did actually happen. That was exactly what was needed. Life was very different from then on. And Colin needed to wear a device in his mouth to eat and even speak. He wore a dressing over his missing right eye, and one day a small boy insisted that he wanted to see what was under there. So eventually Colin sort of knelt down and took his big patch off and showed the, the child... He really had a good look, this little boy. And then he said, geez, what a bummer. Colin was cancer-free for more than a decade, and recognition for the tranquilizer gun guy started finally to arrive. In 1999, Time magazine included him as one of the 100 most influential people of the South Pacific, which is probably lowballing it. His New Zealand Order of Merit arrived a year later, and media interest steadily grew. But in the 2000s, he developed esophageal cancer, and the prognosis wasn't great. He asked his doctors if they could give him two years. I think at that stage, we'd been married 48 years, and he told them that he wanted to make 50. And in actual fact, he made just short of 52. Hmm. So he did very well. On the 4th of May, 2008, Colin Murdoch died in Timaru. He was 79. His funeral was held at the large Caroline Bay Hall, and it was full. The man who knew how to do everything was also respected by everyone. Philip Howe again. I just have this perception of Colin as being someone who was doing his best um, for as many people as he could and was driven by the need to help people rather than to make money off them. One can't help but think that um, he, you know, he left the world a much better place because of who he was as well as what he made. David Murdoch is convinced Colin knew what he'd achieved, but as his son... He can't help but feel like his dad never got the full measure of fame that he deserved. He says it was like winning second division lotto. It's nice, but it's not the big prize. Marilyn says her husband's fame has grown, but in a weird way. I think generally he has become better known, but it it seems to be overseas and perhaps not necessarily in Timaru. There are still lots of people who've never heard of him. The people who have heard of Colin and who respected his corkscrew mind, they know what was lost with his death. People still to this day will say, God, I miss Colin. You know, he, he, he would know what to do here. He would know what was, uh, what was needed. And his family miss him too. Fishing was a big thing for the Murdoch family, and that's how David would choose to spend more time with his dad if he could. And naturally, the man who knew how to do things knew a better way to do that too.
He, he certainly had his own way of fishing, and it was quite successful. Often we're getting fish when no one else are, uh, at, the, at the lake is getting any. So. Uh, and you're not about to share that secret, are you? Uh, definitely not. This episode of Eyewitness was produced by me, Justin Gregory. The engineer was Jeremy Veal, and the executive producer was Tim Watkin. Many thanks to Philip Howe from the South Canterbury Museum for the use of audio from their film on Colin Murdoch. You can listen to every other episode of Eyewitness on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio Public, and of course at rnz.co.nz forward slash eyewitness. Now, Colin Murdoch was a great New Zealander, but if you're in the mood for stories about some not-so-great Kiwis, then you should listen to RNZ's Black Sheep. It's all about the shady, controversial, and sometimes downright villainous characters of our history. Eyewitness will be back again in September, and until then, ma te wa.